Little House on the Prairie will be seen tonight so we can bring you a very special episode of The Gen X Files. And I'm ready to take a chance again. Ready to put my love on the line with you. Been living with nothing to show for it. You get what you get when you go for it. And I'm ready to take a chance again. Ready to put my love on the line with you. <laughs> you, you blew that out so hard at the end. <laughs> Welcome to the Gen X Files. I'm Jim. I'm Adam. And today's show is all about foul, foul play. play. Ho, 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 ho. <laughs> it's a beautiful rendition. Um, Thank you. You know, they were going to... Uh, it was between me and Barry yeah. Manilow. Yes. I also, also, I was very... Uh, I was a lot younger. My voice hadn't changed yet, so... Yeah. I had kind of the... Well... The morble tap... Ta- mor- yeah. Morble? Mor- yeah, mor- mor- tabernacle morble. Tabernacle choir. Yeah. The castrato. Yeah, I mean, you were about eight years old uh, when they were recording this. And Seven they, or eight. They yeah. said, like, it's either going to be Barry Manilow or Jim. Yeah. And, and, and my voice changed. Right yeah, in the middle, yeah. I was like, ready to take a chance. Oh. The most unfortunate ball drop ever. Well, between me and uh, Bob, <laughs> Mike Brady or Bobby Brady, which one Bobby was? Bobby Brady. It was Bobby. No, no. Oh, no, it, it was the middle Brady. Uh, J- Peter. Peter. That's when it. it's time to change, it's time to rearrange. Oh, no. My voice is changing. I'm shaking you. <laughs> yeah, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, foul play. Foul play, yeah. Oh, man. Oh, God. I have not seen this movie in decades. And when I was a kid, I loved this movie so much. And watching it again was just pure joy. It was just like, yeah. and I and I was telling you, because I was laughing so, I mean, I was laughing so hard that like tears were coming out of my <laughs> eyes. And I don't know if it was, I was laughing because it's so funny or just the rem- <laughs> remembering how much I laughed as a kid. Right. And, you know, my stepdad and I, eh, you know, we had our issues, let's just say. In a you very, had a great, perfect relationship. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But, I just remember how much he, when he would laugh, it yeah. would like that was the magic power, right? Yeah. Like yeah. when we watched the Muppets and when we watched this, when I found out that I could make the old man laugh, that yeah. was like a superpower, baby. Oh yeah, yeah. And and him laughing was just was the greatest joy, right? Because yeah. yeah. he was usually such a <laughs> grump, right? Right. To put it mildly, He's a very serious, intense man. <laughs> well, yeah, the PG version is he was a grump. Um, <laughs> But enjoying comedy with him was like was the joy of yeah. of my yeah. life, and at, you know, as a seven eight year old, you just you, yeah. it doesn't matter how much of a jerk no, somebody it's just is. You want a father. A father you're you're like suddenly him. seeing approval, right? Yeah. And you're and you're sharing the greatest of emotions, which right. is laughter, joy, and joy. Yeah, yeah, which is and it was short which supply, is <laughs> the antithesis of your stepfather. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I don't know if if I was laughing so hard because it still holds up. That it's that funny, or it's just the 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 memories of how much I just loved watching this movie because yeah. it's not only like a Hitchcockian, you know, uh, the wrong has, man yeah, or Hitchcockian North by plot. Northwest. Yeah. I mean, it's got a lot of you, you know, you, you could fold in a lot of different Hitchcock sure. movies into it. It's also got a lot. Of, it wears the Looney Tunes on its Ugh. lapel as well, and <laughs> it just out of nowhere, there's these ridiculous. The whole Billy Barty scene. <laughs> B- Billy Barty just called and said, "I am not a living cartoon." <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and it's also Chevy Chase was so charming, yeah, so handsome. Their chemistry was fantastic, and Goldie Hawn was. Might have been my first real oh, crush oh, yeah. that has lasted my entire life. I yeah. have always been in love with Goldie Hawn. Not she, only her beautiful man. eyes and and the fact that she's gorgeous, but just her personality. And, yeah. that, and she's so bubbly and funny. And she's funny and sweet, but smart. Like, when she was on uh, Laugh-In, she played the ditz. And yeah. it was like, oh, the yeah. dumb blonde, she's yeah. the ditz. But then, you know, you see her in, like, Butterflies Are Free or uh, the Cactus, whatever, the one she got the Academy Award right, nomination right. for. She was an amazing actor. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. And so talented and so smart. And just the two of them together, 
was just it was so good that they had to make another movie. They did. Unfortunately, they only made one more movie, but uh, they should have done more. They should have. They could have been the uh, male female version of Jack Lemmon and Walter Matthau. <laughs> Making Jacqueline? Jack Lemon. Oh, they said Jacqueline and Walter no, Matthau. Jack Lemon and Walter Matthau. <laughs> yeah, Jacqueline and Walter Matthau. <laughs> Those 40 movies they made together. Do you remember? He and his wife, Jacqueline. Um, yeah, no. They, I, I wonder yeah. why they stopped. I wonder why. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, eventually we'll cover the other. Uh, seems like old times. It seems like old times. With we'll Charles Grodin. See. I don't know. I, I think it was. We'll have to watch that one with Phoebe because there's a whole pack of dogs in it that she would love nice i just i feel like and we'll talk more about chevy chase in a little bit but like i feel like chevy chase is a great actor and the more you get to know him the more you realize what a dick he is <laughs> well chevy chase comes from a really rich family yeah he's yeah. not just some struggling actor. he's like val kilman there's a few no he's like high society yeah. gilded age Look, like pedigree there's yeah. some people like val kilmer chevy chase uh elaine from seinfeld um, oh, yeah. They come from, like, billionaire families. Oh, you know? I didn't. Did, is she? Oh, yeah. I oh, didn't she realize comes from that. a very wealthy family. She's really funny. Well, she's oh, got she's the talent. She's great. She also, you know. She's, she's not also a dick. So, like. Exactly. And it's, not that, I mean, Val Kilmer wasn't either. He just, um, um, was he? Yeah. Oh. He was a bit. Well, I didn't know how much of a. <laughs> Chevy Chase <laughs> definitely <laughs> eclipses both of them, I'm just saying. But it's, there's a difference between you don't need the work. Yeah. And in, in, in struggling, Right. right. And Chevy never needed the work, and he was just extremely funny, extremely charismatic. The first breakout star well, Saturday yeah. Night Live. Yeah, I mean the 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 thing he did in this movie, the way he was in this movie, would get him cast in movies for a couple decades. Mm -hmm. And that that he did that charming, like kind of deadpan guy. He did that so well, like that was so natural. He has like, I think Chevy's got four solid movies yeah he's got this well, maybe more he's got this seems like old times fletch vacation i i mean i i love christmas vacation but it's it's part of that franchise so I mean, yeah yeah and the first movie obviously was the best but exactly for me christmas vacation hits the nostalgia button like foul play does for you right yeah i think chevy chase suffers from the kevin bacon syndrome but yeah. instead of like accepting it right that he yes he, i should meaning, have been a bigger star yes he should he wants to be a leading man but he shouldn't be but he was but yeah. he kept bouncing back right, he never right. got to the point of oh, will ferrell or who you know whomever yeah, somebody you, that you, you know, could bank on 100%. exactly somebody yeah. who's always going to be making movies but unlike kevin bacon chevy chase never accepted the fact that he could be a really good actor and do a lot of really good work if he just wasn't the leading man. Right. And, I'm, you know, maybe he did, but I think he always kind of resented it. I, okay. You know, you look yeah. at the trajectory of community, yeah. you know, and that's, yeah. that's there. You're watching the beginning and the end of the angry old man syndrome. <laughs> and, you know, where it comes from resentment and anger. And then eventually it's going to hit racism. Yeah. You know, yeah. If, it, if it goes far enough. Uh, far enough. Uh, now you ask Chevy Chase enough questions, he's going to go there. <laughs> but... Let's, we got it out of the way. Yeah, yeah, okay? yeah. So now we can just celebrate Chevy Chase in this movie. I, I had a very different... I had never seen this movie until we watched it. Uh, I'm surprised I hadn't because I love Hitchcock and I love comedies. And, and the other two movies we're covering this month, I absolutely adore. Yeah. Uh, but I'm really glad. I, don't, I didn't find it as funny as you did, but I think that was because I was still absorbing the plot and like it getting put together. And, and how many things had been aped and copied from yes. this movie over the years yes. of like, oh, yeah. Yeah. It, it, a lot of tropes that seem extremely <laughs> yeah. hackneyed yeah. started in this movie. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think it was one of the first movies where they the person hid behind the door. Yeah. yeah. When she hid behind the door and, and maced the guy. Uh, yeah. And did the, the secret hidey spot. Yeah. I think the, the part that I laughed the most at was... <laughs> when they keep getting cars, the car chase is great. Oh, I know, I know. It's one of the best car chases. It's one of the best comedic car chases <laughs> ever. Literally the same thing every time. I'm a cop. I need your car. Yes. Okay. <laughs> he just just drives into a pizza place, and then you know it is because of this movie that people think that's legal. It's not. <laughs> yeah. Cops can't take <laughs> no, your car. You can't. If a cop is like, I need to take your car, you can tell that cop to f off if yeah. you want. Um, but he did it three times. Crashed the car. Poor guy with the camper. Yeah. For real. Um, <laughs> and then they steal the limo yeah. from the driver. 
And then the realization that there's this couple, this <laughs> old couple in the back from Japan. It's a, a couple that doesn't speak English that are tourists that are rightly so scared out of their minds to be hijacked well, by this couple. They're flying down the road in San Francisco. And then when they find out he's a cop, Kojak Bang Bang. Kojak Bang Bang. Their reaction is one of the greatest moments in oh the my film. God. It's so, so great. funny. Yeah. They're just having the time of their lives. And when they do the jump and then yeah. she looks back and they're gone <laughs> and, they're and then they pop the up. Bump. It's a... Uh, it's just there's moments like that. There's all there's, there's I, scary moments. There's suspenseful moments. My that, my that, favorite moments is anytime Burgess Meredith is on screen. Oh my god! <laughs> or Dudley Moore. <laughs> Burgess Meredith doing karate is the greatest I, thing in the world. Yeah. I'll get you. Done. All right, all right. Well, let's get into let's it. Let's do it. Yeah, I just I'm yeah. so excited. It's, it's just fun. it's been so long since I've seen this film, and it's really one of my. It's. I would have to say it might be my favorite Chevy Chase movie, and that's hard to say because there's a lot of good. In yeah. This. Yeah, I think if I had seen the sooner, I would probably agree. But it's just, but it is. It's just vacation. It's just so, like, ingrained in my memory. But the character he plays here is, it's unlike a lot. He didn't really get to play, like, a leading man yeah. hero yeah. type. And he played it in such a great, self deprecating. So weird. I didn't believe him when they were like, yeah, he's a cop. And I was like, really? <laughs> I just like, he's like, because he's, he's a just a smoking. weird dude. Yeah. He's, he's just living just on a houseboat. Dude. But it yeah, great. it's just. Uh, anyway, I'm sorry. Right. I'm so excited. Take yourself back, 1978. Woo. Uh, March 22nd, Carl Walenda of the Flying Walendas dies after falling off a tightrope between two hotels in San Juan, Puerto Rico. You know, you don't see a lot of tightrope walkers anymore. No. No, that's not really a thing anymore. May 25th, a bomb explodes in the security section of Northwestern University, wounding a security guard in what would become the first Unabomber attack. Yay. I'm trying. I, I literally wrote all these before I saw the movie, and I could not find any comedy in anything. <laughs> no. Well, yeah, the Unabomber. You know, the only thing that's funny about Ted Kaczynski is he's the uncle of our good friend Greg Kaczynski. Greg, yeah. yeah. Who's carrying on in his footsteps. Yeah, yeah, it was nice. But Greg, well, he doesn't create, like, actual bombs. He just creates... Uh, artistic bombs. Yeah. Oh, or he goes and, and uses your bathroom <laughs> and then drops a bomb in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Greg. Sorry. Sorry. Greg is great. And uh, he has no relation. To, no, no uh, relation to, to, to the Unabomber. Yeah. I don't want to start that rumor. No, 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 no. Uh, June 22nd, Chiron, a satellite of Pluto is discovered. Nice. Uh, it just, uh, it, I put that in because it blows my mind that it was only like 40 years ago that they discovered that there was a moon to a planet in our solar system. Like They're still planet. discovering stuff. That's true. The celestial bodies are a mysterious <laughs> place, Adam. <laughs> they are. July 14th, Foul Play is released in theaters. And I'm ready to <sighs> take the chance You love Barry Manilow. So I do much. love Barry Manilow. I do. And the funny thing is, uh, around that time, it was, uh, it was the, uh, you know how like rappers have beefs? You know, there's yeah. like the uh, beefs. What am I, like 80? <laughs> um, but you, you know, know, you're I'll, a Gen X guy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Plus there's a whole Netflix show called Beef. Sure, sure. But you know how like, uh, you know, there's like East Coast, West Coast. Or, yeah. you know, they, they, you know, they feud or whatever. Feuds, yeah. Well, in the 70s and 80s, the biggest one of those was Criss Cross and Barry Manilow. Because they were fighting it out. Like Criss Cross, the hip hop band? Christopher Cross. <laughs> I call him Criss Cross because we were buds. I was like, that's a weird feud. Because Criss Cross... Christopher Cross, or Criss Cross, <laughs> like I call him. Uh, you know, Criss Cross was named after Christopher Cross, sure. too. They were his adopted children. Um, <laughs> they, they wore their pants backwards. It did. That was part of Criss Cross. Christopher Cross. Christopher Cross would do that. Discipline. He started that whole yeah. thing. Well, with Sitting the at the piano with his pants backwards. Yeah, put your pants on backwards. You're being bad boys. My zipper's digging into my butt. Anyway, they were fighting it out between who was going to do the soundtracks. Because he they sounded so much alike. Because... You know, there's ready to take a chance yeah. again. And then you got Christopher Cross with like Arthur's theme, you know. Oh, yeah. When, the ma- when you get caught yeah. between the, the moon and New York, York City. City. The best that you can do is fall in love. Very similar. Very similar to this. Uh, next year we'll cover Arthur. So. Arthur and me, boom, yeah. new, new. Uh, true, they were very similar. They actually sent death threats to each other. Uh, There's at one point where um, Christopher Cross uh, put a flaming cross inside uh, Barry Manilow's yard. Oh wow! And said, "I am the true voice." Nice. And, we, and Barry Manilow. It just, went a little far. Barry Manilow would send him off-brand furs <laughs> just to, to effort him. 
Uh, all right, so Foul Play starts with writer-director Colin Higgins. Yeah, baby. Yeah, he's such a brilliant, brilliant writer. Uh, Higgins was born in France to an Australian mother and an American father in July of 1941. Ooh la la, good day. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, how, that's, he, that's exactly how he, how he sounds. Yeah. That's how he would greet everybody. Ooh la la, good day. <laughs> His father signed up for the U.S. Army shortly after the attack on Pearl Harbor in December of 1941. Nice. Best choice to make when you have a newborn. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, man, this was a different time. It was kind a different time, I know. Uh, Higgins spent most of his childhood in Australia. Uh, he moved to California to attend college at Stanford, but then had to drop out after losing a scholarship due to being obsessed with theater. And the fact that nobody could understand what he was saying. Yeah. I mean, it's, he's speaking French with an Australian accent. Aye. Aye. C'est la vie. C'est yeah. la vie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he moved to New York and hung around the actor's studio, but couldn't find work until becoming a page at ABC Studios. Nice. He then joined the Army and wrote for the Stars and Stripes newspaper. He was discharged in 1965, spent six months in Europe, and then went back to Stanford to study creative writing. All right. After Higgins graduated from Stanford, he got a job as an able-bodied seaman, saying, Oh, because I want to... <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure he's going to be more Australian than French. I think we're going to just, like, balance it out and make him American. Sure. Okay. I don't, Cause cause to I, be honest, he probably didn't have an accent at all. And my Australian accent is highly sus. All right, here we go. <laughs> Because I wanted to see the Orient, it didn't take me long to realize that the days of Conrad and Eugene O'Neill were over. There was no work and too many people to do it. Yeah, he wanted he wanted to be a better writer, so he thought he'd go live, you know, in the world and like do this stuff. And unfortunately, in 1965, it just wasn't the thing anymore. Right. <laughs> yeah. He visited Expo 67, a Category 1 World's Fair, which I had no idea there was more than one category, category of one World's, World's Fair. Warning, warning. Category 1 World's Fair, dropping in Eugene, Oregon. I don't know. It's so weird. Uh, it was this in Mon- year, we're expecting a calico- Category 5 World's Fair. It's, <laughs> it's going gonna, to decimate Boston. It's going to decimate. In Montreal, it was in Montreal. It was inspired by the, he was inspired by the film exhibits there and decided to learn about film. I am really sad that we don't have World's Fair Expos anymore. I mean, we might. Do we? I just don't think that we know about them. I don't. Well, I mean, to be honest, I do. I think I looked this up because I, when I was obsessed with H.H. H. Holmes and the World's sure. Fair in the 1890s and all that stuff, I looked into it. And I'm pretty sure that before the pandemic, they were still having them like every two years. But they weren't the event. It's that- an expo, not a World's Fair, because it's a Category 1 World's Fair. Right. But they still had Category sixes. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, look, yeah, it was every World's so often. Fair was yeah. a, 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 it was like the Olympics when people cared about yeah. the Olympics. You know yeah. what I mean? There was like these events that captured the world's sure. attention sure. that I just don't think happens anymore. I mean, that's what happens when no, well, why? the why world gets we... smaller. And There know. was this thing invented called the internet. Okay. Well, <laughs> you know what? It didn't bring us closer together, <laughs> Adam. I don't need to take my apart. horse and buggy to Chicago to learn about electricity. Well, I would like to. I well, think if okay. you took your horse and buggy to Chicago to learn about electricity, you'd probably remember more about electricity than if you just skimmed it on the net. Or, Old man corner. Or I just learn everything I need to know about electricity. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> All right. <Okay>. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Colin Higgins began working on a Master of Fine Arts in Screenwriting at UCLA, where his classmates included Paul Schrader and his brother, actor Barry Higgins. Okay. Uh, Paul Schrader is a great writer. And director. Yeah better writer than director, but a great yeah. director. <laughs> uh, while there, he made the short films Opus One in 1968, a satire on student films, and Retreat, an anti-war statement. Film. He's a rabble rouser. Yeah, he's, yeah he, did, he wasn't afraid to speak his mind. Uh, his thesis was the basis for the movie Harold and Maude. Oh, such a great movie. Uh, after graduating, he went to work for a wealthy family in Los Angeles as a part-time chauffeur and pool cleaner in exchange for free accommodation where he met film producer Ed Lewis. All right. Lewis worked on nine films with Kirk Douglas and nine films with John Frankenheimer. He also produced the TV miniseries The Thorn Birds in the 80s. It was very popular. It was. Higgins showed a draft of Harold and Maude to Lewis, who then showed it to Robert Evans at Paramount. Uh, Evans shepherded like movies like Rosemary's Baby, Love Story, The Godfather, and Chinatown. There is an amazing documentary that you, if you haven't seen called The Kid Stays in the Picture yes. about Robert Evans. Yeah. And Robert Evans is just one of those guys. Yeah. I said to her, look, lady, you're going to do it my way. And she said, I'm taking the highway. And I said, you take the highway. You're not coming back, baby. You're going to make it. You're going to make it my way. And she did. And it was a hit. 
Um, <laughs> that is essentially Robert Evans, yes. <laughs> but it's him. It is such a great... And this guy, like, produced some of the greatest yeah, films. Yeah. He, he, was, he was a juggernaut and, and, and amazing. Like, he was, yeah. Groundbreaking producer saw things that other people didn't. The 70s, all of probably most of your favorite movies in the 70s, he yeah. had a hand yeah. in, in one way or another. Right, right. Uh, Higgins wanted to direct the script of Harold and Maude himself and was allowed to shoot a director's test for $7,000, but Paramount was not sufficiently impressed in how Ashby was hired to direct the film. Hal Ashby, he directed everything. He did. He was. Uh, he worked a lot. Uh, Higgins collaborated well with Ashby, and both were pleased with the final film, but it was not a large box office success on original release. Oh, man. Every... Like emo kid, every all of us outcasts, we all have a Harold Maude period where you're in love with a ninety year old woman. Well, it wasn't no <laughs> Harold. Harold Maude is such a great book. You haven't I, seen it. I know right? I've not seen it. There's he he like gets a he gets a jaguar for like his birthday or whatever. He's just like a weird like a, the animal. No, the car, oh, okay. like a sports car, and okay. then he turns it into a Jaguar hearse because he is the <laughs> he is the first emo kid. He's the first. That's like, amazing. Goth, okay, he know. sold me. And he sold how, me. He sold me on Jaguar. And you hearse. know, and that's why he falls in love. But uh, but Ruth Gordon, yeah, is an amazing yeah, actor. Yeah, you, yeah. You, uh, you might remember her from the Every Which Way But Loose and Every Which Way You Can, playing the mother, or she plays the chimpanzee. No. <laughs> The orangutan, <laughs> and no, I think she's, uh, sorry, I she, apologize she, to Ruth Gordon. That's really mean. That was awful. She, uh, no, I think sorry. she's, uh, uh, the mother of, uh, Clint Eastwood, or related yeah, to him somehow. Yeah, anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, in yes. Harold Mott, it's just, she has such a way about her that she, it was just so likable and yeah. funny, just genuinely, as a person, just a funny human being, and Bert Court, Court? Bert, Bert Court. Bert Court? Again, the kid was amazing. He was, yeah. he was pretty much the prototypical emo. Yeah. You yeah. know, and, and, and every depressed weirdo <laughs> at some point was obsessed with this movie. Right, right, right. This one included. We, we, will, we will cover Harold and Maude at some point. Uh, it was around this time that Higgins wrote a script called Killing Lydia. Uh, Higgins wrote the script with Goldie Hawn in mind, who he met through Hal Ashby. Hal Ashby again. Again, he's he's networking. He's networking. He's doing it. <laughs> if you yeah. know Hal Ashby, then you know everybody you need to know. Uh, Killing Lydia was Higgins' love letter to Alfred Hitchcock, paying homage to by referencing several of his movies, including... The 39 Steps, Saboteur, North by Northwest, The Man Who Knew Too Much, Dial M for Murder, Notorious, Vertigo, and Psycho. Psycho is my favorite a movie of Alfred Hitchcock's North by Northwest, I think is mine. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Oh, Psycho. I, I Psycho is probably my favorite movie of all time. Oh, it's amazing, yeah. and it's very close. But I think I I fell in love with Hitchcock with North by Northwest, okay. and then you know, because they yeah. didn't let me see Psycho until I was a little a little you were older. It was weird, man. It was hit or miss. It was like here, watch Deliverance when you're four, <laughs> but you can't watch Psycho. Until you're eight. Well, it's called Psycho. It must be about a psycho. I don't know, man. Uh, only going to let you watch guys get raped. Maybe. No shower killings until Maybe you're older. <laughs> uh, so the movie also includes a MacGuffin, an object that starts the plot but is forgotten as the movie plays out. Uh, Hitchcock popularized this plot device. Yeah. It was playing against type because it was, you know, it's there's the tropes. If you see a gun, the gun's got to be used. Yeah. If the same, you know, but Hitchcock would play against that stuff. Yeah. And just like... In your favorite movie, well, thank you. No, just like in Psycho, which I love, so I'm just teasing you. Uh, killing off the bigger star at the yeah. beginning. Yeah. You know, that was the first time anybody did that, you know? So it was very... Yeah. He, he was very... Uh, he was very concerned with uh, upsetting norms. Yeah, I mean, he was. He always thought about the audience and how to, to keep them coming back. Exactly. Yeah. Zig when others zag. Exactly. Pop when others pip. Yeah. Zipped when others zop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> jib when others jab. Jib when others jab. Uh, despite the script being very well written, studios did not bite on Killing Lydia, and it was shelved. Yeah, it's such a good script, by uh, the way. At this time, Higgins wrote the screenplay for Silver Streak, a comedy thriller about two guys traveling from Los Angeles to Chicago aboard a train. Another Hitchcockian film, by the way. Yes. Very yeah. much so. This is more of the wrong man. Yeah. Um, with... Gene Wilder being falsely accused of a murder. Right. Again, a lot of, like, misdirection yeah, and yeah. missing bodies and <laughs> flips and floops and uh, blackface. 
Uh, yeah, the script was bought by 20th Century Fox for a then record $400,000. That's a pretty good sale for your first script. For Silver Streak? Yeah. Oh, Silver wow. Silver Streak, $400,000. Well, it was, I mean, it was also the first pairing of Richard Pryor and yeah. Gene Wilder. Uh, which... Yeah, there was their first movie together. It was box office gold, earned $51. million from a $5 million budget. Oh, I loved it. Uh, they were going to make three more movies together, Wilder and Pryor. I have a really weird love of train movies. Yeah. Like train episodes, train movies, video game train levels. I don't ride trains. a lot of trains. That's so funny. I don't really like trains, but I love train entertainment. I have spent more time on trains in the last five years <laughs> than yeah. I've spent my entire life. Crazy. Yeah. But yeah, I love train stuff. Train's great. I love trains. I, I wish that the trains were, there were more trains in the U.S. By the way, the, the blackface scene in Silver Streak, it was Richard Pryor's idea and doing to get him to do that. He didn't want to do it. Okay. But they had to disguise him. He had to get away. We'll cover Silver Streak eventually, and we can talk about all the blackface you want, Jim. Well, there's no blackface in foul play. There's some white face. (laughs) But there's there's no some white face. facing and some and some anti dwarfism. <laughs> Due to the success of Silver Streak, Higgins became a hot ticket in Hollywood, and Killing Lydia was given a second look. It's so funny because we talked about that with Scream, how he wrote Killing Mrs. Tingle, and nobody yeah. gave an f about that. But as soon as the Scream things ran, they made it into Teaching Mrs. Well, Tingle. Killing Lydia was a much better script than Killing Mrs. Tingle. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Higgins rewrote the script and took the script to Paramount, who wanted Farrah Fawcett to star. Higgins says when he sold the script, he wanted to direct it so badly he didn't care who was going to play the lead roles. Okay. However, Fawcett was in the middle of a legal battle with the producers of Charlie's Angels, so it was decided to go with Han. Uh, the whole deal with that is that Spelling Goldberg Productions, the producers of the Charlie's Angels TV show, warned all the studios that they would be sued for damages if they employed me. According to Fawcett. Yeah, she didn't work for a long time. No, they effed her. After they, bad. Oh, my God, so bad. After her bad. And I love Farrah Fawcett, and she did end up becoming a very great actor. Yeah. But around that time, she was a little limited. Like if you yeah. see... L- Logan's Run. Logan's Run. <laughs> or Saturn 3. <laughs> or Charlie's Angels. She, she didn't quite have the acting muscle that she eventually had. She didn't have... The thing about Goldie Hawn is she plays cute and ditzy... But there's substance underneath. Yeah. She's not a bimbo. She's not a dummy. She's just a very sunny, ebullient person. Yeah. Who's also got a serious side. Well, you, she plays ditzy so well that like the moment when you realize that that's an act, it's like you totally reinvent. You're like, oh, oh, I misjudged you. Like she was very good at that. And she wasn't just a damsel in distress in this. No. She took no. care of herself. She just, didn't. you know, when Brian Denny's he's like, bring your umbrella. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. like she. He knew. Yeah. <laughs> don't. Ooh. Uh, Billy Barty. Don't ask him. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but so, but, but it was, I think, I, I really couldn't see anybody. I but agree. Goldie Hawn. I agree. I agree. I, she, she was perfect for this movie. Yeah. Yeah. So the cast Goldie Hawn. Because uh, Fawcett couldn't be hired as Gloria Mundy. Gloria Mundy. Yeah. Born on a Mundy. <laughs> the name Gloria Mundy is a reference to... Sick Transit Gloria Mundi. Latin for... Thus passes the glory of the world. A phrase that was part of the rite of papal coronation until 1963. What? Why? I Thus passes the glory of the world? Yeah, it passes to him through God to him. Like, it's all the... You know, you talk to God through the Pope. Mm. So... It's just appropriate considering the plot of the movie. Pope's a dope. The Pope is a dope. All right. Yeah. That's my take. (laughs) She she rose to fame on the NBC sketch comedy program Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In from 1968 to 1970. Famous for having Dick Nixon on where he said, shock it to me. Yeah. Uh, Before going on to receive the Academy Award and Golden Globe Award for Best Supporting Actress for her performance in Cactus Flower in 1969. Very good. Uh, Butterflies Are Free is another great movie to watch her in where she it's based on a play I believe where she's the neighbor of this blind guy and they kind of fall in love but it's again just her being charming nice. and amazing nice prior to foul play uh, Han's last hit was in Shampoo in 1975 directed by Hal Ashby great movie um, I've never seen Shampoo. I've heard a lot of good things about yeah, it. Yeah, uh, I think it was Carrie Fisher's first flick. Oh, I think it was. Um, in 1976, she starred in The Duchess and the Dirtwater Fox. I love that movie. A Western romantic comedy starring George Siegel. I've never seen it. There's a really funny... She plays... So, 
she's the duchess, quote quotes. Right. But right. it's like this whole con artist thing. And yeah. I love yeah. George Siegel. He's absolutely He's phenomenal. Yeah. They're great in it. It's a really fun little con artist okay. Western weird movie that I loved as a kid that right. probably blows. Well, we all know that my taste as a child was pretty mixed. It actually lost money, did not do well at the box office, so Han took time off from her career to focus on her second marriage to Bill Hudson of the musical group The Hudson Brothers. Nice. Yeah, uh, that marriage spawned two kids, Oliver Hudson and Kate Hudson, both of whom have had long acting careers of their own. Yeah, well, Kate Hudson, she was in uh, Almost Famous. Yep. And, She's uh, in a ton of stuff. And Oliver Hudson did more on TV. Than he was on that uh, David Spade. Yeah, the uh, something life, something, something. Yeah, life. it was he and and, uh, and the guy that played Putty on uh, yeah. Seinfeld. Yeah. And the woman that helped me win $20,000 on Celebrity Name Game. She played Putty's Catherine wife. Catherine Hahn? The, oh, other, the other one. The other one, that, whose name I, I can never, never forget. I never remember her name. I'm so sorry that I can't remember your name. You were so nice and wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Apologize. <laughs> the success of Foul Play allowed her to make Private Benjamin, which she co-produced in 1980. Oh, that was such a groundbreaking movie. It was the first time, you know, you had a movie about women in, in the, the army. army. Yeah. She was nominated for Best Actress Oscar for her role in Private Benjamin. It was also a film that kind of took... It was a perfect film for her because it... She played like this... And she did this a few times, but yeah. she played kind of this rich, ty- entitled, spoiled person. Yeah. Who ends up getting conned into joining the army because they tell her how great it is or whatever. Right. And then when she gets there, she's just like, I want out. And it's really funny. And Eileen Brennan is, I think she might have won an Oscar or at least was nominated. Oh, yeah. Playing the drill sergeant. And then Eileen Brennan also did the TV series based on Private Benjamin that lasted for many years. It was a great, great movie. And if you haven't seen it, (laughs) see it. (laughs) <laughs> Han would go on to star in a variety of hit movies in the 80s and 90s. Uh, seems like old times in 1980, which prepared her with Chevy Chase. Oh, and added the glorious edition of Charles Grodin. Nice. Swing Shift in 1984, where she would reconnect with Kurt Russell and start a 40-year relationship. That was a musical, I think. Uh, was it? Oh, uh, she had actually met Kurt Russell originally in like 1968 or something, and then... And then they lost touch, and they reconnected. Uh, she learned from her first two marriages that marriage wasn't for her, so they've never gotten hitched. Uh, they've So they've been together for like 40-plus years. They're such a cool couple. They uh, just seem... 40 years, coming up on 40 years. They just seem like a cool couple. Like, yeah. Like, I, I was so happy. You know, there's certain couples that you're just so happy that they get together. And yeah. Want, and the fact that they've stayed together for 40 years is they, just awesome. It's, it's really funny, because uh, they do have a kid together, Wyatt Russell, who plays John Walker, the U.S. agent in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Mm-hmm. He's done some other things. But uh, but they've separated and gotten back together so many times. But then it, like, it like they also own, ho- like, eight different houses together. Yeah. And it was like, yeah, they're never, why would they ever not be together? Yeah. You know, I mean, like, it's. And at this point, it's like, what are you going to do? Yeah. You're both in their 70s. Yeah. Uh, she still looks great. They both still look great. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, she Not in, that that matters. <laughs> she was in Wildcats in 1986, the football comedy. Yeah, which was the, the first. Break, uh, groundbreaking, you know, woman in playing in sports. Well, no, she was playing the high school coach of the football Oh, she team. was the coach. Nipsey Russell was the, was the principal. And oh. it was the first pairing of uh, Woody Harrelson and Wesley Snipes. Yeah, it was actually their first movies. Yeah. Yeah. They were the Wildcats. Yeah. And there was like... I, for some reason, thought she was... I know I've seen this, but I thought for some reason she played on the team. She was, she was the coach. No. She was a little old to be in high school by then, in the 80s. I didn't realize it was high school. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was a pro team. No, it was high school. This is how much I apparently did not pay attention to Wildcats when I saw it. It's this, like, totally run-down, inner-city kind of school that everybody's given up right, on, and nobody right. gives an F, and then... But, you know, there's all sorts of sexism and stuff. It's a really great yeah. movie. Yeah. And then it has that really horrible rap song yeah <laughs> wild cats wild oh cats. yeah <laughs> is it a bit of the wild cats wild cats uh she did overboard in 1987 with kurt russell oh uh, yeah that's a guilty pleasure of mine no no guilt about it baby that's a funny movie he literally tricks a woman who's lost her memory into thinking it's his wife <laughs> it's i'm a, not saying that it's, it's a little unsavory but it's a fairy tale. I I adored that. It was one of those that was on all the time when yes. I was growing up, and like I loved it. Yeah. yeah. Look, he kidnaps her and treats her horribly at the beginning, but then they fall. Then, they then, do. Then, yeah. uh, 
she, uh, the best is she doesn't realize that, uh, how are these kids mine? Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, finally, uh, the Stockholm Syndrome sets in, and right. she decides to and marry him. she decides him. to stay him. Yeah, stay with him. But she's also, again, that kind of billionaire, like, she's super rich. Yes. And whatever. Uh, Bird on a Wire in 1990 with Mel Gibson. Eh, it was all right. It was, it was really disappointing because everybody was so excited to see the two of them together. Yeah. Uh, because it was at the height of Gibson's career and the height of her career. And it was just kind of a letdown. He played this, like, this was around the time where they were doing all of these 60s counterculture where, oh, the guy that bombed yeah. something back in the 60s, oh, now, oh, now they now think he's, he's yeah. dead, but oh, now he's alive. And right. she was his old girlfriend back in the thing. Right. And, so and she had to help with the, yeah. Right. It's like yeah. sneakers. It's like uh, yeah. all these movies that had all this kind of, like, 60s counterculture Right, the ramifications of right. the sixties counterculture. It, yeah, it's yeah. like if now we were doing movies that took place place in the aughts. That's how yeah. that's how scary this is. By the way, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Death becomes her in nineteen ninety two with Bruce Willis and Meryl Streep. Unbelievably, uh, top ten my favorite movies is so good. Oh my god, everybody in it. It's so fun to see Meryl Streep playing uh, just wicked and funny, and she yes. and Goldie Hawn were so great together. <gasps> and Bruce Willis so, so mean to each other. Oh my god! <laughs> so and Bruce great. Willis playing such a meek character. Yeah, yeah. Unlike, he is so good yeah. in it. Yeah, Robert Zemeckis. If you haven't seen this movie, and at the time, the uh, effects were groundbreaking. Like, yeah, people were like, how did they do this? The same guys who did uh, tr- Tremors. Yeah, yeah. And they did such a great job of the effects, and it's just this dark comedy that is so effed up. So good. All the way so to the good. end. And it's, it's, it is brilliant. If you, we're definitely covering this movie. Yeah, if oh, you yeah, haven't yeah. seen it, make sure you do. She most recently can be seen in the Christmas Chronicles movies starring as Mrs. Claus to Kurt Russell's Santa Claus. Okay. <laughs> I think I saw those. They were fine. Uh, I saw the first one. Uh, it was fine. So Chevy Chase was cast as Lieutenant Tony Carlson, the <laughs> very weird <laughs> cop. He's so good. Uh, Chevy Chase was born Cornelius Crane Chase. Cornelius Crane Chase. Uh, he was named for his grandfather, Cornelius, and it's actually technically his adopted grandfather. It gets super weird. His mom was adopted by some rich family or something. Ooh. I don't, it, Maybe that's why he never felt like he was good enough. I Probably. I, it, the whole thing, it was going to take too long to get through, so I just cut it out. Uh, while the nickname Chevy was bestowed by his grandmother from the midi- medieval English ballad, The Ballad of Chevy Chase. It's a good ballad. Yeah. <laughs> it's it? one of my favorite. <laughs> Sing it to yourself at night while you fall asleep. Oh, the ballad of Chevy Chase, living all over the place. Don't look him in the face, old Chevy Chase, the ballad of Chevy Chevy Chase, Chevy Chase. Uh, as a descendant of the Scottish clan Douglas, she thought the name appropriate. Uh, Chase is a 14th generation New Yorker and was listed in the social register at an early age. F you. Uh, yeah, the social register was a <laughs> highfalutin thing to so that rich people could know who other rich people were. Yes, and, and how far their families went back to being yeah. pure. Well, in fact, his mother's ancestors arrived in Manhattan starting in 1624. Uh, he became the breakout cast member in the first season of SNL in 1975, where his recurring weekend update segment became a staple of the show. Yes, and where he started his lifelong uh, addiction to painkillers. Oh, yeah? Well, he played... Uh, he played President Ford. Yeah, the the always the falling down stuff. And yeah, yeah and so the Pratt he, falls. Yeah, and some of these Pratt falls were Bad. very elaborate, and he got hurt, you know, and and uh, and I think that's where the the painkiller stuff started. Okay, he played Ford. He did the Weekend Update. He yeah. was also really handsome. He was handsome and funny, which is yeah, you know, John Belushi, uh, hilarious, one of the funniest guys in the world. Yeah. Dan Aykroyd again, yeah. but a, but funny, 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 but, but a goof. kind of weird looking. Yeah, all, they all look like sketch comedians. They all look like those. Yes, this yeah. is how you're gonna. And he did not. He was way too pretty. No, but he, the fact that he was so funny was just the double whammy. And then he realized, and also because he came from such a wealthy family, right? He didn't care about any of that stuff. He didn't have any sort of like loyalty or whatever because he didn't. No, care he didn't about money or anything. He didn't have to be doing any of it. No, he was very. Con- he was. The guy's not a team player. He was very oh. concentrated on his own career and becoming a star. His whole thing was he wanted to be a big ass movie star. Yeah. And he tried. And he did for a while. Yeah. It, it worked. He also made a really good choice when he had plastic surgery to put that cleft in his chin <gasps> to give him just one imperfection. Yes. That cleft. He looks, he looks like we, just like I said, 
that John Travolta is was made to be a Mad Magazine caricature. Yeah. Same thing with Chevy Chase. Yeah. He was just perfectly formed to be a Mad Magazine caricature. Yeah. So as both a performer and a writer on SNL, he earned two Primetime Emmy Awards out of four nominations. He was also an insanely good writer. He yes. started with Harvard Lampoon. He did uh, the National Lampoon. He was one of the original writers yeah. and performers yeah. for that. Uh, the guy had a really pedigreed sketch. He was a funny dude. Yeah. And, and writing career. I mean, the guy earned his status. He, sure. he may have been a rich guy that didn't need to care about anything. But he didn't coast into it at all. He worked his ass off no. to get where he was. No. In late 1976, in the middle of the second season of SNL, Chase became the first member of the original cast to leave the show. Uh, Chase, he actually left. I didn't put this in, but he actually left because his um, soon-to-be wife at the time did not like living in New York. So they moved to L.A. Yeah. Uh, Chase has returned to host SNL eight times until 1977 when he was reportedly banned after hitting Sherry O'Terry on the back of the head and harassing female writers. 1997. Did what I say? 77. 1997. <laughs> he he hosted eight <laughs> times the one year after he left. Wow. He left the show but hosted eight more times. Instead Are of, you no. sure he was a still a <laughs> member now? Uh, I will also say that uh, Lorne Michaels has gone on record saying that the whole thing of him hitting Sherry O'Terry and harassing female writers is not true. He said that I've never seen him do that. No one complained to me about that stuff. It just kind of came out. and then, But he's never been back on the show. But okay, I mean, yeah. I think look, Chevy Chase and Lauren Michaels are lifelong friends. I, I, he, yes. he was one of the main people when he started the show, right? One of his best pals, and you know, yeah. he I mean, yeah, kind of shepherd it. So there's a lot of loyalty there. Yeah. You know, I think he just doesn't want to s on him. But honestly, uh, I would think. It, mm. I think there's definitely some truth <laughs> to, to the, these these things. Chase was the first SNL cast member to land a leading role in a theatrical film. A lot of people think it's John Belushi in Animal House, but Foul Play was released on July 14th, 1978, and Animal House came out two weeks later on July 28th, and 1978. technically, uh, Belushi was just a supporting character. He yeah. wasn't the star. He, he was not a, yeah. He was wasn't an ensemble. The That's true. That's true. Uh, Harrison Ford was actually Higgins' first choice to play Lieutenant Tony Carlson as he was Higgins' carpenter, yeah, but uh, Ford turned it down to be in Star Wars. Yeah, I'm going to be in this space opera instead. Yeah, I, I don't think it'll do anything. It, just, it doesn't, I feel like, like he must have known that Star Wars was going to be huge. Like he must have had some feeling because I feel like this part is much more interesting. Oh, yeah. Like the foul play character is much more interesting than Han Solo. I mean, maybe, I don't know. I think Harrison Ford is a man of his word. He probably said he's going to do Star yeah. Wars before he got offered this part. Probably. And was yeah. like, well, i got to do it. Yeah. yeah. Look, Hal, I'd much rather do this part than play Hans Plodo or whatever his name is. <laughs> yes. Uh, Steve Martin also read for the part but wasn't cast for unknown reasons. I don't know if it would have been right. Like his it persona. It would have been a different movie yeah. if they had. Yeah. They would tailor it to his comedy, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. I think Harrison Ford would have been really good. It would have been really oh, fun yeah. to see him in a in a comedy. Oh yeah. Because yeah. anytime he's ever done comedy, it's it's he, he loves doing it. Oh yeah. He never gets a chance to do it, and he's great <laughs> at it. Yeah. Chase can most recently be seen in Zombie Town, co-starring Dan Aykroyd, based on the R.L. Stein book. I've almost watched that like eight times. <laughs> it just it just dropped on streaming not too long ago. Uh, and he Almost. Can, he's, uh, <laughs> can be seen in Glisten and the Merry Mission voicing Santa Claus. Okay. Well, look, hey, you know, glad he's still working. He, he, yeah, he's still doing work. I mean, I, I... Look, Chevy Chase is a complicated dude. He is. You know, and I, all of these guys that get these bad raps, it's easy to just kind of S on them. And, yeah. And, yeah. and a lot of times, rightly so. And look, I don't agree with this crap, but you got to put yourself in that person's shoes too and see where they're coming from and why, you know? And yeah. I think Chevy, unfortunately, is one of those guys that that cannot take a joke about himself, probably. And I think he can, yeah, I think he, he or can only he, do he likes point. He likes making fun of himself, but if you make fun of him, no. It just seems like on the set of, he was very unhappy on yeah. the set of Community. Yeah. Which is so stupid because it reinvigorated his career. Yeah. And, and he was great on the show. And he was I hilarious mean, like on was... the show. And it's just, I think, not being the young, hip star yeah. 
And being the old guy, it's hard for him to be the old guy. And yeah. and I get it. Look, he was the the pinnacle of sarcastic, bap, yeah. bap, bap, quick, funny, handsome guys. And you're the old, you know, quote unquote, racist character. <laughs> you know, it's like, I get it. But it's still, it's like you, you shot yourself in the foot, Chevy. Yeah. I mean, you know, you've done it over and over again because you take yourself too seriously, it seems. Yeah. yeah. And you got to just let stuff roll over your back. You're never going to yeah. have everybody love you all the time. Yeah, well. Unless you're me. <laughs> Burgess Meredith was cast as Mr. Hennessy, the, I think he was a landlord? Her landlord neighbor, or something? Neighbor. He was neighbor. I don't know. There was something about one of them renting to the other. I don't know. I assume it They were good him. friends. And they were close, yeah. Uh, Meredith established himself as a leading man in Hollywood with critically acclaimed performances as Mio Romagna in Winterset in 1936, George Milton in Of Mice and Men in 1939, and Ernie Pyle in The Story of G.I. Joe in 1945. Shazam, I'm Ernie Pyle! <laughs> it was such a weird it's performance. Not, yeah, he was Gomer Pyle's brother. Hey, it's, Ernie Pyle, my brother! It's amazing that they had a story about... Uh, Action figures 30 years before they came out, 20 years before they came out. I know. Yeah. Uh, he is one of the most memorable. He was in one of the most memorable Twilight Zone episodes, Time Enough at Last, about the bibliophile and the end of the world. All the time in the world. I can read all of the books. I read all of the time in the world. God, he's so good. Oh. Oh, no, 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 not my glasses, no. Uh, he played the Penguin in the 1960s Batman TV series. Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> he's so good. He's, he's started the whole... Wah, wah, yeah, wah, wah. he's so good. Uh, he played Mickey, Rocky's trainer in the first three Rocky movies. Come on, Rock, I gotta tell you, Rock. You're gonna get him in there, you're gonna beat him up, Rock. You gotta go uh, in there and you gotta punch him in the face, Rock. He technically was in three other Rocky movies, just in archival footage. I'm a ghost. I'm a ghost, Rock. I'm coming back to ghost. Yeah. For his performances in The Day of the Locust in 1975 and Rocky in 1976, he received nominations for the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor. Should have won. Should have won both. Meredith won a Primetime Emmy Award for Supporting Actor in 1977 for Tail Gunner Joe and was nominated for the same award the next year for The Last Hurrah, a remake of the film starring Spencer Tracy. Okay. He wrote in his 1994 autobiography, So Far, So Good, that he had violent mood swings called, caused by cyclothemia, a form of bipolar disorder. That one, strangely enough, that 100% makes sense to I, me. It, it, I had no idea, but I could totally see him suddenly snapping yeah. and just breaking things. <laughs> His last film was Grumpy Old Men in 1995, a sequel to Grumpy Old Men in 1993, starring Jack Lemmon and Walter Matthau. Oh, so good. He Both was so funny. Was so great. Yes, yeah. but he played like Walter Matthau's dad or one of the yeah. guys' dad. He was in, it's supposed to be in his 90s. Yeah, even though there were grumpy old men that He's, were old. Yeah, and he, they just had him swear a lot. Gotta, 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 I'm going to take the skin boat to Tuna Town. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. He was getting. He yeah. was so great. He was having a lot of sex. That old man. You know what I had for breakfast? Whiskey. You know what I had for lunch? Whiskey. You know what I had for dinner? Whiskey, whiskey. with a side of whiskey. Oh, yeah. oh, little darling. He he had a little bit of an accent in this one. He did. Oh, yeah. Gloria. He was. So I'm good. going to have to. Yeah. He uh, was. How do you use my karate on you? Oh, the dude yeah. is from Ohio. I don't know what accent he was doing because he said Kenya. So I think he was trying to be British? No, it was, it was uh, Scottish or, or, or yeah. Irish. Okay. He was doing a little bit of his Irish bro. It was, his, yeah. Anyway, he's so funny. I'll come and I'll help you. Uh, on September 9th, 1997, Meredith died at age 89 from complications of Alzheimer's disease nah. and melanoma, and his remains were cremated. That's so, look. Look, the guy lived to be almost 90. Still, I think dementia... Alzheimer's is the yeah. worst way to go in the world. Worst way to go in the world for right. somebody so smart yeah. and talented. To, it's just like Bruce Willis, you know? Yeah. It's somebody that's so, like I said, I'm watching, which is uh, really appropriate for yeah. our Hitchcock and Comedy Month. I'm rewatching Moonlighting. Right. And just seeing him in his prime, fast talking, so, so talented. Yeah. And same thing with, with, with Burgess Meredith. Yeah. Know? Oh, yes, me. Don't, I don't mean, get those cigarettes. I'm sure that after Grumpy Old Men, I think he probably realized, like, he couldn't remember lines. I mean, I yeah. think that's why he wasn't doing more movies. Yeah. Like, he was like, okay. Well, I mean, he but was still. amazingly old, too. Uh, so. Yes, he was almost 90. Uh, Brian Dennehy was cast as Inspector Fergie Ferguson. Bring your umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> Dennehy had roles in over 180 films and in many television and stage productions and has won two Tony Awards, an Olivier Award, and a Golden Globe and received six Primetime Emmy Award nominations. I think I spoke of this. I think I spoke of it <laughs> when we did The Presumed Innocent. Yeah. 
uh, program. But Brian Dennehy, another one of my uh, talent crushes. Yeah. Every time I see him, I adore him. And it it seriously bothers me when he plays a bad guy. Like, it seriously yeah. Yeah. hurts me in my soul. It's like, no, no, not you, Brian. What are you He's doing? He's so good at it, too. I know. Because they're not, they're so layered. Like, you know, the, in First Blood, yeah. such a layered performance. Yeah. And yeah, he's just so good. So good in this. Yeah. You remember uh, FX with oh, uh, yeah. oh, Brian? Yeah. I, that was one of the reasons I wanted to get into Hollywood. Yeah. Because that movie. Such, it's just, you know, uh, just one of those guys that's just so good at what he does. And in this movie, he is absolutely perfect. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He plays so well against the weird cop yeah. that is Chevy Chase. Well, and also yeah. when they're, you know, when they're, when they're interviewing, Gloria Mundi. Yeah. And it's just, you know, her stuff is just crazy. Just his looks and everything, like... Yeah. She's well, <laughs> She's got crazy eyes. <laughs> it also just shows you what a better actor he was than Chevy Chase oh, and yeah. how subtle he is compared to Chevy Chase. like, go, 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 go. <laughs> she's so pretty. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, Denny, he started in theater, which led to roles in movies and TV shows, like Looking for Gus- Mr. Goodbar in 1977, starring Diane Keaton, Tuesday Weld, Willie Matherton, Richard Kiley, and Richard Gere. It was like a, one of the first movies to kind of deal with promiscuity. It was uh, Dennehy's first feature. Uh, he was also in Semi-Tough in uh, all 1977 as well, starring Burt Reynolds, Chris Christopherson, Jill Clayburgh, Robert Preston, Lada Lenya, and Burt Convey. Great movie about the NFL. Yeah, uh, F- Fist, or F-I-S-T, in 1978, starring Sylvester Stallone and directed by Norman Jewison. His uh, breakthrough role was the overzealous Sheriff Will Teasel in First Blood in 1982, opposite Sylvester Stallone as John Rambo. What are you doing in my town? I'll tell you what, Lynn. Get in the car and I'll, I'll give you a ride and uh, you can go to another town. How about that? <laughs> we'll be covering First Blood in January, so stay tuned. Yeah, it's about time. If you do anything, we'll be in a long time if you're really neglected. Oh, my God. <laughs> So looking forward to that. Uh, Denny, he would have a long career making a ton of movies and appearing on TV. Unfortunately, he died on April 15th, 2020, at the age of 81 of cardiac arrest due to sepsis in New Haven, Connecticut. So sad. God, he was so good. He was 81. I mean, he had a good long career. And it, and and worked until he died because yeah. everybody wanted to work with him. He was, he was yeah. another guy that was just a journeyman actor that yeah, was he, great. Also managed to survive a pretty controversial thing about... Uh, Stolen valor. Lying about his military career. Yeah. Uh, but he totally owned up to it. He, he did. He, he covered it the way he did. He, he did. said, look, I shouldn't have done that. It was awful. Yeah. I totally get if you don't want to work with me. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody Fs up. Even if you F up that bad, if you own it, take yeah. responsibility, you're truly sorry for it. We, It's okay to forgive people. Yeah. Because yeah. we all F up. You, it's okay to grow and change. Yes. <laughs> In and, fact, and, we should be yes, growing and, should, and changing. It, yeah. That's what we've lost so much of is nobody apologizes or admits wrongdoing anymore. No. They just triple down. I can't be wrong. I can't be wrong. Uh, you think I'm racist now? Well, you just wait. <laughs> Deadly Moore was cast as Stanley Tibbetts. Uh, Higgins had already written the role of Stanley Tibbetts for Tim Conway, but when the actor turned it down, he offered it to Dudley Moore instead. Okay. I love Tim Conway, <laughs> love him, but Kenley Moore owned this part. He would have been so weird in that. It I'm sorry, been, it would have been uncomfortable. Uh, watch Bono's. What are you doing? You want to get it on? You want to oh. get it on with me? So yeah. Tim Con, yeah, he's great, but it would have been weird. No, this was this part. I can't think of anybody else besides no. Dudley Moore playing this part because so he was so perfect. genuinely. I just love how he, he's just like, why? And it gets to the point where he's just, why does this keep happening? <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay, I did something wrong. It's just he, uh, in the in in the scene, with you know, the, when uh, it's just so funny because back then, you know, there was this whole bar scene and pickup scene and yeah. single scene was just yeah. kind of starting out, you know, in the '70s, and uh, and the fact that she comes into the bar and she's like, take me home. Oh, oh, oh. Can, I, can, I, can I finish my drink? No, just take me home. And it's just the okay. it was a, it was one of the perfect misunderstanding. Yeah, it was it was know. written very well. And goes on for f and ever. It Let's does. be honest. It does. That misunderstanding scene is like twenty minutes long. Oh my god, that that, that po- the Pullman bit. No, what's it called? The uh, Murphy bed. Murphy bed. When it goes back and they just come back down. It's so funny. He was just so good. Uh, it was a great introduction to most Americans to Dudley Moore, as it was his American film debut, and led to his being cast in 10 by Blake Edwards the following year. Right, which also starred uh, 
Well, didn't star, but also had Don Colfa. Don Colfa, yeah, from this Ooh. movie. Yes, uh, Moore first came to prominence in the UK as a leading figure in the British satire boom of the 1960s. He was one of the four writer performers in the comedy review Beyond the Fringe from 1960 that created a boom in satiric comedy. And with a member of that team, Peter Cook, Ugh. collaborated on the BBC television series, not only, but also. So good. So good. Yeah, this Cook is, and Moore were amazing. Oh, my God. Together. They were kind of the precursor of Monty Python and that type of absurdist yeah. humor. Yeah. And they just had, because usually Dudley Moore was the, you know, the comedic guy and, and Cook yeah. was the straight man. Yeah, Cook was very deadpan. Yeah, and it was just if you have a chance to see some of their old stuff back when they were young and beautiful, <laughs> uh, do yourself a favor because it's just it's it, again it's it's just another guy who worked his way to where he was and earned it. Not only an amazing, hilarious comedic actor, but also an extremely accomplished pianist. Uh, uh, they jointly received uh, Cook and Moore jointly received the 1966 British Academy Television Award for Best Entertainment Performance. They worked together on other projects until the mid 1970s, by which time Moore had settled in Los Angeles to concentrate on his film acting. Yeah, uh, Moore starred in Bedazzled in 1967, written by Cook and directed by Stanley Donen. Uh, he actually composed the soundtracks for Bedazzled, as well as Thirty Is a Dangerous Age, Cynthia in 1968, and Admissible Evidence in 1968, Staircase in 1969. The Hound of the Baskervilles in 1978, and Six Weeks in 1982, among others. He continued, this is what amazes me, is that he became a huge star, and he still did composing soundtracks. He loved like, playing the piano. He loved it. Uh, he Moore, used to go on tour and, and do concerts. Yeah. Moore was an Arthur. Moore was an Arthur in 1981, the fourth highest grossing movie of the year. <laughs> where he stars as a drunken New York City millionaire. Let's just tell you one thing, Russ, here. I just have a little secret. <laughs> just a so, there were so many little hints of that yeah. in foul play yes. of like, oh, I get it. I get yes. it. Yes, it was that it was that glorious time of our lovable alcoholic Arthur yeah. and Arthur too on the rocks. Uh, for Arthur, Moore was nominated for the Academy Award for Best Actor and won a Golden Globe Award. He really should have. He and Sir John Gielgud, yeah. their scenes were impeccable. And then in Arthur uh, John Gilgood plays his butler, his long suffering yeah. butler. Yes, yes. And he gets sick, and then Arthur has to sober up and right. take care of him. And, and it's like. It's a sweet story. It's a really sweet story. In April 1997, after spending five days in a New York hospital, Moore was informed that he had calcium deposits in the basal ganglia of his brain and irreversible frontal lobe damage. Oh, my God. He underwent quadruple coronary artery bypass surgery in London. And also suffered four strokes. He was in such bad shape, I remember back oh. then. Also, <laughs> he was married to uh, Susan Anton, who was like six foot something. Oh, really? And so the two of them, was it was amazing. He was just <laughs> like, she would carry him in her purse. <laughs> she was so much bigger than him. On September 30th, 1999, Moore announced that he was suffering from the terminal degenerative brain disorder, progressive supranuclear palsy, also known as PSP. Good Lord, what a, a horrible name. Parkinson plus syndrome, some of the early symptoms being so similar to intoxication, they had been reported as being drunk and that the illness had been diagnosed earlier in the year. Oh, man. Uh, the, the disease eventually required him to use a wheelchair. Yeah. Uh, it's just terrible irony that he was so popular in Arthur playing a drunk guy and then he just couldn't get away from it. No. Well, uh, it's just the super nuclear palsy. Progressive and, super nuclear palsy. And also Parkinson's Plus. Yeah. That's like Disney Plus. You don't want that plus. No, no. You don't want the extra. It's a very, a very uh, fast progressing form of Parkinson's. Uh, Moore died on the morning of March 27, 2002, as a result of pneumonia, secondary to a mobility caused by his PSP in Plainfield, New Jersey, at the age of 66. It was a blessing. I, He's just a prisoner. The of his fact own that body he was then. only like when all this started happening, he was like maybe in his late fifties, early sixties. Oh, yeah. Like that's it's just horrible. Awful. Well, it's think awful. of like uh, Michael J. Fox. I know. I you know. know. Who started know. getting the Parkinson's? You know what? In his thirties. Yeah, yeah. I think he figured that out on one of the. He it started was, getting the the yeah. one of the pinkies started going or something during one of the Back to the Futures. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Moore's best friend, Rena Fruchter, was holding his hand when he died. She reported his final words were, I can hear the music around me. 
Good last words, man. <laughs> it is. <laughs> yeah. It was weird. He he eventually Rena Fruchter was a really good friend of his. They they had met doing music and he actually moved in with her. Oh, wow. And then it caused like huge problems with her husband and their family, and eventually she bought the house next to hers and then put Dudley Moore in it. He must have been divorced from Susan Anton by that. I, he must have been, yeah. Uh, it was just, it, it just sounded like the end of his life was just awful. I, it just, you know. Well, at mean, least he got the good. I just, the last words, man. Yeah. I, mine are going to be like, I think I just pooped myself. <laughs> <laughs> Why does everything hurt? <laughs> yeah. You're all a bunch of a-holes. I wish you were all dead instead of me. <laughs> Uh, the film also featured Rachel Roberts as Gerda Caswell slash Delia Darrow, uh, the, the uh, fake Pope's handler, I guess. She, well, she was part of the the, 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 tax, the, the church, tax, the church league, uh, t- quote unquote terrorist group. Yeah, that taxing the church wasn't enough, so they had to kill a bunch of people or something. <laughs> but they uh, need to prove their point. But she was so good. And the fight between her and Burgess Meredith, let's be honest. One of the highlights of the whole film. She was a tough old broad. (laughs) She was a tough old mama. Mama, (laughs) that's what it was. Tough old mama. (laughs) She was a tough old mama. She was a tough old mama. Uh, Roberts was nominated for the Academy Award for Best Actress for This Sporting Life in 1963. Okay. She also appeared in Murder on the Orient Express in 1974. Yeah. Picnic at Hanging Rock in 1975. And Yanks in 1979. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> I've never heard of Yanks. I don't know what it is. It's uh, about Yankees. I, oh, I assumed. Yes. I mean. It's not about like hand jobs, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you're thinking. I assumed it was a groundbreaking movie about hand jobs uh, in 1979. You see Yanks? <laughs> Somebody give you the old Yanks. <laughs> God. Uh, Roberts married Rex Harrison in 1961. Their marriage was very tumultuous with lots of public fighting. Yeah, because he was a raging alcoholic. Well, she was too. <laughs> They it all were. Help. All British actors of a time seemed to be raging yeah. alcoholics, but very professional they would, functioning uh, yeah. alcoholics. I mean, she was great in the movie. Rex Harrison was Dr. Doolittle, right? Yeah, yeah, yes. The original doc- yes. So that's weird. I can't believe she was obsessed with Rex Harrison. Hey, you know, I sometimes opposites attract. I don't know. Uh, She's bizarre. They divorced in 1971. Uh, Roberts was devastated by her divorce from Rex Harrison, and her alcoholism and depression worsened. Oh, you she could was, see it too. I mean, oh yeah. You know, by the time she did this movie, she, she her face she looked a lot older than she was. Yeah. The drink was taken its yeah. toll. She had moved to Hollywood in 75 and tried to forget about the relationship. Uh, in 1980, Roberts attempted to reconcile with Harrison, but he was married to his sixth and final wife, Mercia Tinker. Rex, Rex, please. Please get back with me. Look at me, Rex. I'm begging yeah. you. I'm begging you on my knees. I think uh, by... My wife is standing right <laughs> here. Little uh, Rachel, this is a little inappropriate. Uh, on November 26, 1980, Roberts died at her home in Los Angeles at the age of 53. Ah, so young! Uh, she did not look like she was 51 in that movie. No! I, no. She looked like she was 60. In foul play. No, it was bad. Uh, her death was initially attributed to a heart attack. Her gardener found her body on her kitchen floor, lying amidst shards of glass. She had actually fallen through a decorative glass divide between the two rooms. Oh, my God. An autopsy later determined that her death was a result of swallowing lye, or another alkali, or another unidentified caustic substance. Maybe as, she was just so drunk she reached for the wrong bottle. I didn't uh, know. As Adam, well as, I always keep my lie next to my whiskey. As well as barbiturates and alcohol, as detailed in her posthumously published journals. <laughs> oh, good Lord. Uh, the corrosive effect of the alkali was the immediate cause of death. Yeah, yes. That will just rip you apart. It would, it would, yeah. The coroner documented the cause of death as... Swallowing a caustic substance. And later... Acute barbiturate intoxication. Her death was ruled a suicide. Oh, so sad. Yeah, that's just, she couldn't get over Rex Harrison. Like, Rex, Har- Rex Harrison killed her. Okay. Well, it's not Rex Harrison's fault. <laughs> <laughs> he should have known. He should have waited not gotten married again. But, God, just feel how bad you'd feel Ugh, if somebody killed be, themselves. Yeah, I would feel very bad. It's happened to me quite a bit. I mean. <laughs> Every time I get over So many ladies. Uh, drop they a can't lady have and, this. Mm, they don't want nothing. No, they drink lie. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a lie. Uh, Eugene Roche was cast as Archbishop Thorncrest, uh, which uh, technically it was his twin brother. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like he played both parts. Another great twist in the movie. Was I love fun. that his twin brother was part of the 
tax the church. Like they were nemeses. Well, he was good time Charlie. <laughs> he was a good time Charlie. <laughs> Roche was well known as the Ajax Man in the 1970s TV commercials. He appeared in television comedies in the 80s with recurring roles on Soap as Christine Sullivan's father on Night Court. Yeah. Uh, Webster and Larry Appleton's abusive boss on Perfect Strangers. Yeah, with Balky. Yeah. Perfect That's strangers. all you know about Perfect Strangers. All right. They were cousins. Yeah. And they had... It. And uh, the other guy from Perfect Strangers... The guy who played Larry Appleton? Yeah. He was just on Moonlighting. <laughs> uh, William Frank Father was cast as Whitey Jackson, the killer albino. Love his name, by the way. <laughs> Foul play was Frank Father's feature film debut. He wasn't actually no, an albino. He was it. not an albino. They wear contacts uh, and a lot of white face. Yeah, but why didn't he wear pink contacts? I don't know. I don't think anybody really had seen an albino before. (laughs) They sure as hell made them villains after that. Poor albinos, man. I know. You're you're like one of the the smallest minorities in the world, and yet every every time you're ever on screen, (laughs) well, they're they're gonna be up to something. It's really funny because uh, one of the characters on Venture Brothers is 100% based on this character because oh, yeah. he still wears yeah. ascots and the yeah. same kind of like... Because it's so funny. He's undercover, our albino friend, and uh, he he's, you know, going to, to, to kill the Pope, right? And he's in his disguise as a maintenance guy, but he has this pressed... <laughs> Perfect white <laughs> jumpsuit that nobody like a, would ever wear. A boiler and suit. Like a yeah. yellow ascot. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just like, like, come on, man. Well, wow. What are you doing? That's an interesting way to, to dress up for the opera. You're a fancy maintenance mm. man. Ooh. Fancy boy. Hmm. Why we come from fancy fields. <laughs> Frank Father guest starred in many popular television series of the late 20th century, including MacGyver, Night Court, The A Team. Hill Street Blues, Remington Steel, Murphy Brown, Picket Fences, Star Trek, Deep Space Nine, Melrose Place, Empty Nest Wings, NYPD Blue, Tales from the Crypt, and Mama's Family. Frank Father died on December 28th, 1998 from complications of liver disease at the age of 54. Ugh, good lord. What the hell? He's like, it's uh, too young. Matthew Perry. Matthew Perry, who just died at 54. Sad. Uh, Mark Lawrence as Rupert Stiltskin, a.k.a. The Dwarf. Uh, Lawrence's pockmarked complexion, brooding appearance, and New York street guy accent made him a natural for heavies. And oh, he, yeah. And he played scores of gangsters and mob bosses over six decades. Yeah, he was always a bad guy. He was never playing the, the priest or the, the nice guy. Uh, or in the 50s, Lawrence found himself under scrutiny for his political leanings. When called before the House Un-American Activities Committee, he admitted he had once been a member of the Communist Party. He named Sterling Hayden, Lionel Stander, Anne Revere, Larry Parks, Karen Morley, and Jeff Corey as communists. What a dick. Yeah, he was blacklisted and departed for Europe where he continued to make films. Yeah, I guess he got away with it. He screwed over all these people. Like, it's terrible. Uh, He played gangsters in two James Bond movies, 1971's Diamonds Are Forever, opposite Sean Connery. Diamonds Are Forever. And 1974's The Man with the Golden Gun, opposite Roger Moore. The Man. With a golden gun. I don't know. I, I don't remember that one ever. <laughs> he, he also portrayed a henchman opposite Lawrence Olivier in Marathon Man in 1976. Is it safe? Is it safe, Adam? Is it oh safe? God, I, is it, it safe? I'm going to take a tooth. I love that movie, but it is the, the most excruciating scene. Oh, please don't take my tooth. <sighs> oh, what are you doing <sighs> with my teeth? Don't take gives my me, teeth. It gives me chills thinking about oh, it. That hurts so bad. His, Stop. Uh, Why don't you try acting? Mark Lawrence's final film role was in Looney Tunes Back in Action in 2003, appearing as an Acme Corporation vice president. Uh, Lawrence died of heart failure on November 28th, 2005, at the age of 95. All right, good run, I guess. Good run. Turning your friends in to the House of Un-American Activities Committee gives you longevity. Snitches live forever. (laughs) Marilyn Sokol is Stella. Uh, She was the friend who, with the... The Here's what you gotta do. Afro, the the brown afro. I got this. Weep, 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 oh weep, my weep. God. <laughs> you got your mace and you got your brass knuckles. Uh, uh, Sokol is perhaps best known for her role as Lulu Brecht in Can't Stop the Music in 1980, the movie starring the Village People. Of course, the most amazing, <laughs> absolutely amazing musical ever. You have to. Uh, she was nominated for Worst Supporting Actress at the first Golden Raspberry Awards for her role in the film. Ah, she was great in this movie. Yes, yeah, she was. Uh, she was also well known for her role as Ma Otter in Emmett Utter's Jug Band Christmas in 1977. She also was in everything. She was yeah. in all sorts of sitcoms. She always showed up on. On movies and TVs, The Friend. She's very funny yep. and had a great career. She's received an Emmy Award, an Obie Award, and a Bistro Award. Uh, 
Uh, she is still kicking around at 79, but hasn't acted in a, in, in a few years. What's a bistro award? Um, it's like a New York, I believe it's a New York, like, Times. It's like a specific, like, newspaper award or something. She ate six crepes. Yeah. In one sitting, she, so she, she got the to, bistro award. She went to a bistro, yes. Uh, Billy Barty was cast as J.J. McEwen. In adult life, he stood three foot nine due to cartilage, hair, hypoplasia, dwarfism. That okay. is a weird title for that disease. It is. Cartilage, hair, hypoplasia, dwarfism. Hmm. So the name of my band in high school. Nice. <laughs> during, that's wordy. <laughs> during, yeah, that's why did I didn't take off. on the drummer's uh, didn't take off, no. Bass drum? He no. quit as soon as he was like, yeah, I can I, only get to cartilage, and then I don't know what to do. I paint that on my drum kit. During the 1950s, he became a television actor, appearing regularly in the Spike Jones Ensemble. Yeah. He uh, founded the Little People of America organization in 1957 to advocate for people with dwarfism. Yeah, he was extremely uh, vocal, and he was one of the greatest proponents of dignity and, you know, stop dwarf tossing and stop yeah. all this nonsense yeah, for human people. effing beings. It, in, in foul play, one of his lines was literally, we prefer the name Little yeah. People. Yes. Yeah. It, he always... Did his roles with dignity. Like, this role, yes. It was very Looney Tunes. It was for comedy, yes. But it wasn't... It didn't make fun of him for his height, really. You know? No. The only reason why no. he was targeted is because of the word dwarf, you know? Right, right. She thought he was... he The dwarf. Yeah. And yeah. Look, honestly... His sales pitch wasn't that clear. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I love the fact that it could have just been a thrown away scene, but she went back and like talked to him and so apologized. Good. And, <laughs> and almost she goes killed to him smash again. The ah, his scream. He's just like, he does it so well. <laughs> she's just, and he was so sweet to her too when she comes in. He's like, I, yeah, I've got a really bad personality and. Yeah, you know, it, people, it's my fault. Yeah. It's not your fault. You help me decide that I'm going to get away from this yes. and go open up a gas station in the <laughs> desert. <laughs> away from everybody, especially you. Uh, he In the early 1970s, he was a staple in a variety of roles in a children's TV programs produced by Sid and Marty Croft. Oh, yeah, like uh, H.R. Puffin stuff and yeah. Sigmund the Sea Monster yeah. and all those awesome, weird Acid. Some weird Sid and Marty Croft weirdness. <laughs> yeah. Content. Some of his more substantial film roles were as the High Aldwin, the Village Elder, and Willow alongside Warwick Davis. Oh, yeah. Uh, creator of the Cosmic Key, Gwildor, in the 1987 cult classic film Masters of the Universe. I have the power. And as cameraman Noodles McIntosh in Weird Al Yankovic's UHF. I'm Noodles. Uh, Barty died of heart failure in 2000 at the age of 76. That's a pretty good run. He had a good run. He's the kind of guy that I would have loved to have sat down, had a beer with. Yeah. Would have had a great conversation, yes. great time. Like, he, he was such a genuinely nice person. And you know he had some stories. Oh, you know he had some <laughs> stories. Uh, Bruce Solomon was cast as Bob Scotty Scott. Uh, he was the guy who she picked up and gets the the packet, the MacGuffin from from him. She gets the packet of the cigarettes. cigarettes with all of the yeah. evidence about the assassination. Yeah, that guy uh, looked like every dude in the 70s. He did. He's best known for the roles of Sergeant Foley in the TV show Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, and Kenny Zuckerman in Beverly Hills 90210. Uh, his last film appearance was in Autofocus in 2002, the biopic starring Greg Kinnear's Bob Crane. Oh, yeah, good movie. I cannot find any other information. I don't know. I don't. I think he's still alive, but I don't know what he's doing, yeah, and he, he hasn't acted in 20 years. He he did his duty. He was yeah. in everything. He's a guy that would always show up on sitcoms or Magnum or, you know, he was one of those yeah. always working actors. Uh, Don Colfa was ca as Scarface, uh, who gets killed by Whitey Jackson. Yeah. Nice makeup job, too, I know. Scarface. It's like they... <laughs> Put a bunch of silly string on his face or something. Uh, you may recognize Kalfa as the mortician Edri Ernie Colton Bruner in the 1985 cult horror comedy The Return of the Living Dead, which we actually had on during our Halloween party. Oh, such a great movie. It's such a great movie. Uh, it has a Clue Gulliger. It one does. Of my favorite. Clue Gulliger. Clue Gulliger. Yeah. And, uh, so much fun. Say his name. Clue Gulliger. Clue Gulliger. Yeah, I know. It's Clue Gulliger. I, was, I had just enough drink that I just kept yelling, Clue Gulliger. Clue all Gulliger. Over and over again. Yeah. Uh, he was all, Don Colfo was also the bumbling hitman in Weekend at Bernie's. Yeah, and I think he was also in Ten. I think he was like the yeah, orgy guy. I think he, yeah, I think he was in Ten. There's another actor that looks just like him that oh. might have been the orgy guy too. There was a lot of like guys. It was weird. Like the seventies had a lot of types. Yeah, guys that looked very similar that well, played sure. very similar parts. Uh, Cyril Magnin was cast as Pope Pius the Thirteenth. Yeah, baby. Uh, Magnin was not an actor. 
Uh, he actually served as the president of Joseph Magnan Company from 1940 to 1952. Well, he looked like a pope. He then served as his chairman and chief executive officer from 1952 to 1970. It evolved into a multi-million dollar chain selling fashion for young women. He served as general partner and chairman of Serial Magnan Investments Limited, as well as chairman of Lillian Corp. He also served as president of the San Francisco Chamber of Commerce. All right. He was president of the Port of San Francisco and was instrumental in establishing such internationally renowned institutions as the Asian Art Museum, the American Conservatory Theater, and the California Cur- Culinary Academy, serving as head of the California Museums Foundation. How did he get the part? I'm getting to that. He served on the board of directors of the San Francisco Film Festival. He served as the chief of protocol for the city of San Francisco from 1964 to 1988. As a result, he was nicknamed Mr. San Francisco by columnist, columnist Herb Kane. He was also in Maxi in 1985, starring Glenn Close and Mandy Patinkin. Essentially, he was San Francisco. Okay. Like, that's why Colin Higgins put him in as the Pope. Are you saying he was the Pope of San Francisco, I, I mean, yeah. He, mm-hmm. was the, he was the head of the papacy. Uh, San Francisco is weird that way because it also had the uh, Emperor Norton was in San Francisco. Yes. Like Many they, years before, though. They like to bring up uh, common, peop- common people. I'm yeah, this guy was not millionaire. common, by the way. <laughs> sit on the board of everything. He uh, was the absolute opposite of Emperor Norton. <laughs> yes. Uh, he died on June 9th, 1988. Uh, the two-block stretch of Fifth Street North, north of Market and adjacent to Holiday Plaza, was renamed Cyril Magnin Street in his honor. Neat. That's cool. Yeah. I mean, it's nice. Like, it's, you know, he was San Francisco. People, I assume that they would think, oh, people will see him and go, oh, it's Mr. San Francisco. Okay. Yes. He's playing the Pope. Did we talk about Chuck McCann? Oh, uh, no. I was about to do that right oh, now. No. Uh, Chuck McCann. He had a long, long history. God, he was in everything. He played... I don't remember which one was Laurel and Hardy. Was Hardy the fatty? And Laurel was the skinny. I think so. Stan yeah. Laurel and Oliver Hardy. Yes. Let's just say bigger guy. Bigger, fatty is a little fatty is not in. too nice. But he the played fat, him. Fatso. Fatso. He was the fat, <laughs> fat F. In, uh, no. He played that. He was always in comedies and stuff. He was in Space Nuts. Yeah. With Bob with Denver. With Bob Denver. And- it was that short-lived live it's action Saturday morning. We're going to have to cover it because oh, it's so weird. Well, we'll cover it in our Saturday morning cartoon yeah. episode. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, he they couldn't get uh, the actor that played the uh, skipper to, to be in oh, the part. Yeah, so they, yeah. they got Chuck McCann because he was a big guy, too. Yeah. And I just remember, oh, they were cleaning the rocket. And old Gilligan... He saw the launch button, thought it was the lunch button. Oh, so oh, he pressed it because it was time for free lunch. lunch. Yeah. Oh, and they got into some shenanigans. Uh, Chuck McCann also did a ton of voiceover. Like, he had a oh, yeah. very long voiceover career. Uh, he was in uh, the G.I. Joe animated series as Leatherneck. Nice. Yeah. He was also on every. Yeah, he was. He was one of those ubiquitous. character actors yeah. that never stopped working until the day he. Uh, is he still alive? No, Chuck McCann is not. Until the day he died. Uh, Francis Bay was the the beginning, the Pope lady. She took care of the uh, Pope, not the, not the Pope lady, the Archbishop lady. Right. She took was care the of the caretaker. Archbishop the when he got killed stabbed. by his twin brother. And then she was most likely killed as well. Probably. But uh, I didn't realize until I watched the movie, she was also the, uh, she was in the wife of, um, oh God, what's his name? Uh the, cra- the crazy dude who... The crazy anyway, truck driver. The crazy uh, snowplow driver his played his wife in Gremlins. The, the back. Oh, my God. He, they, they, yeah. were, they had a much bigger part in the sequel. They did. They did. Yeah, she was great. And also, I just wanted to mention uh, Roland Mori- Moriyama. Yeah. Who was uh, one of the uh, older Japanese people in the back seat that was hilarious. Yeah. He was on MASH. He was on Magnum. He was on a ton of stuff. He had a really great career, too. The guy, the limo driver looked familiar, too, but I couldn't figure out who he was. Yeah, a lot of them. I mean, yeah. look, I think that was there, Joffrey Brown. There were so many people in this movie and that so many bad. people that just had, like, one small scene. Uh, like, even the the guy who played their the uh, police chief or whatever like, he looked super familiar. Oh, he'd been in a ton of yeah, stuff. Yeah. He, he was, like, a, a really big, like, sitcom actor and stuff. All of them. Yeah. Hope Summers, the, the two old ladies that were playing the oh dirty game God, of the Scrabble. Scrabble. Game. And Queenie Smith, I think, was one of them. She was a huge oh, star, yeah. too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so the movie is released. Uh, Gene Siskel, the Chicago Tribune, gave the film three stars out of four and called it an attractive minor comedy. The kind of film that's described as cute. 
Oh, way to be condescending, a-hole. Wow, he doesn't know how to not be condescending. Uh, on a 1986 Tonight Show appearance, Roger Ebert called the film... A very good picture. All right. Okay. Uh, the movie's theme song, Ready to Take a Chance Again, was a hit. and was on the American charts for 16 weeks and even garnered a Best Song Academy Award nomination. Yeah, Barry was the man. It was sung by Barry Manilow, almost sung by Jim when he was eight. <laughs> yes, it was uh, a- very, very close. It was uh, who also conceived and oversaw its production alongside Ron Dante. Uh, Mandel had Barry another... Manilow, not me. No, M- Manilow, yeah. yeah. Just want to make sure. Uh, Manilow had another song on the film soundtrack as well, Copacabana. And the Copa. Which is probably my Copa favorite Cabana. Manilow song. Uh, it was from his fourth studio album, Even Now. They fell in love. Man, I do Bam, bam, bam. Uh, foul Play is tied with Who's for Afraid of Virginia Woolf in 1966 and The Godfather Part 3 in 1990 for having the most Golden Globe nominations without a win with seven. Yeah, And that's the Golden Globes, man. Isn't that the one given that's like basically crooked? It's the crooked. 93 international reporters. Right. Yeah. That, uh, the, very racist. Yeah, yeah. We found out. Yes. They, they're <laughs> they, trying to change, but the, yeah, yeah, they can't. people are giving back their globes. Yeah. Uh, it was nominated for the Golden Globe, the, and just a big laundry list. Uh, best Motion Picture, Musical or Comedy, Best Actor in, Actor in a Motion Picture for Chevy Chase, Best Actress in a Motion Picture, Goldie Hawn, Best Supporting Actor, Dudley Moore, Best Screenplay for Colin Higgins, Best Original Song, Ready to Take a Chance Again, Music by Charles Fox, oh, sorry, uh, Best Original Song, Best Original Song, Motion Picture, Ready to Take a Chance Again, and Best Motion Picture Acting Debut, Male, Chevy Chase. Nice. He got nominated twice. He got nominated twice, which is super weird. You'd think that... Yeah, anyway. I wonder who won. I don't know. It, it's the Golden Globes. I didn't care to look. Yeah. <laughs> so nobody it's does. like, whatever. No uh, Oscars, eh? No. Well, no, the, for the song. Barry Manilow oh, song. Okay. Yeah. It, it, it's got, it got nominated once. So, I mean, it got one nomination. Well, uh, comedies aren't usually... Unless it's... Oh, uh, uh, Neil Simon. Yeah. Then nobody gets nominated. Well, that's what, like, Dudley Morris, you know, in Arthur got nominated for Best Actor. Like, it's, it's, there's certain comedies that they're, they're willing to take a chance on, but. You gotta cry. Yeah. If you gotta, you gotta, you gotta have a moment in the comedy squeeze where. Squeeze that heart. Where, where you're serious. Yeah. Uh, the movie would go on to make $45 million from a $5 million budget. Not bad. Uh, this would allow Higgins to cement his directing career. He would rewrite and direct 9 to 5 in 1980, starring Jane Fonda, Lily Tomlin, Dolly Parton, and Dabney Coleman. Working 9 to 5. Oh, I love that movie so much. It would make $103.3 million from a $10 million budget. It is one of my favorite comedies. It is so good. Oh, my God. So good. So So fun. good. Lily Tomlin. And, and that was the first time that Lily Tomlin and Jane Fonda worked together. Yeah. And now... That's all they do. That's true. They, they only they work actually, together. I don't know if you know this, Adam, but they actually had uh, Siamese twin surgery to actually be fused together. Wow. So they never have to be apart. It was like opposite Siamese twin surgery. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's called Mia. Uh, it's in the mus- <laughs> okay. I don't know how to say Siamese backwards. <laughs> uh, Isn't Siamese, uh, that's uh, inappropriate now, too. It's conjoined twins. Yes, technically Siamese is, is wrong. You should be saying conjoined. Right. Yeah. Uh, he also co-wrote and directed, uh, this is Colin Higgins, uh, <laughs> not the guy who put together <laughs> Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin. Right, the surgeon. Yeah, Colin Higgins uh, co-wrote and directed the musical The Best Little Whorehouse in Texas in 1982, starring Burt Reynolds, Dolly Parton, Jim Neighbors, Charles Durning, and Dom DeLuise. Mm. Uh, it was a modest hit, making $69.7 million from a reported $35 million budget. People were really excited. It was a big hit on Broadway, yeah. and it was just weird to cast... It was weird casting Burt Reynolds in it yeah. for some reason. Yeah. It just didn't work, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, Higgins, unfortunately, would not have another hit during his career. Uh, he did a couple TV movies and, and had a bunch of projects like ready lined up, but they just never came to fruition. That's too bad. Uh, Higgins was openly gay and died of an AIDS-related illness at his home on August 5th, 1988, at the age of 47. Horrifying. Horrifying. That time is like... A genocide, you know, it was just uh, tearing through the gay community. You had a president who wouldn't even mention the word would acknowledge because he was such a piece of ass. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, so many needless deaths, so many incredibly wonderful human beings lost their lives during that period. The uh, Colin Higgins Foundation was established in 1986 to provide support for gay and transgender youth. It was established by Higgins following his diagnosis with HIV in 1985. What a great thing. 
Yeah, I mean, positive comes out of it. I, uh, Higgins' writing is said to have inspired filmmakers like Judd Apatow, Seth Rogen, Wes Anderson, and Paul Feig. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's, and, and I'm sure uh, Glenn Gordon Karen or whatever from Moonlighting. Oh, yeah. It's very yeah. much uh, I'm sure. yeah. the same. You know, it's got a huge, watching Foul Play again, and then while I'm still watching this, just right. shows what a great influence that had on it. I, it was so well written. The characters were so interesting. Well, that's the two leads were the most down to earth, most regular people. Yeah. And and then even with Chevy Chase being a cop and being a weirdo, but like all the bad guys were just cartoon characters. Yeah. And like it worked. It well, worked. in one moment, they're all standing next to each other and we're like, yeah. they're, every one of them looks like a Scooby Doo villain. Yeah. It was like they kept looking up at the next person. <laughs> yeah. It was like, huh? It's like, huh. It's like, huh. I would have gotten away with it, too. It, it was for you crazy kids. Directed so well. It was just directed well. There actually was a TV show in 1981. Uh, it ran for... They produced 10 episodes, but only ran for five episodes before it got canceled. Uh, it starred Deborah Raffin and Barry Bostwick. Okay. Uh, I'm sure it probably wasn't very good. Uh, around 2007, uh, Foul Play was going to be remade with Goldie Hawn's daughter, Kate Hudson, and Matthew McConaughey in, in the lead. Blech. Uh, it never came to fruition. Not that they're bad actors at Th- all. But that was around the time when Kate Hudson and Matthew McConaughey were in like five movies together. Like it was. We had enough. Yeah. It, it was at the end, tail end of like, they're kind of like, okay. The end of them trying to jam Matthew McConaughey as a romantic lead. <laughs> and they finally just gave up. Yeah. Failure to launch. <laughs> I live at home with my parents. <laughs> so not good. No. Uh, Although I do really like Kate Hudson and Matthew McConaughey, but I just this movie yeah. doesn't need to be remade. It no, doesn't. No, no. It's it's perfect as it is. It's a fun, funny, awesome time capsule of San Francisco in the seventies. Yeah, you get to see Chevy Chase and Goldie Hawn in their prime, and with the, some of the best chemistry. Oh to, yeah, you know, there's a yeah. reason. It's it's like I'm <laughs> curious to know why they didn't make any more movies together. The the scene where they were asking, "What did you think about the first time you saw me?" What about before that? Before that? Oh, and they man. got closer and closer. And eventually, they're literally, their lips are touching and they're just talking to oh, each other. It's so cute. It was so great. It was so great. It's just such a fun movie. There I, are so many great. Yes. I Look, I'd never seen this movie. I love this movie because I love Hitchcock. Yeah. And I love Hitchcock's movies, much like Colin Higgins did. And, and it follows in that thumbprint so well yeah but in a comedy way which is something i would do so like i adore this movie sure it's so good and there's so many great payoffs the whole dudley moore side story that starts with him coming home and she keeps running into him and he's like oh and then he's (laughs) and then he's the composer that was the best best. it was like no one can know i'm here and i was like (laughs) okay (laughs) like that's weird and then it's like oh that's why because he's Leading the Mikado. Okay. Yes. Just these little scenes, like her trying to, you know, she's fleeing being kidnapped. And then you see these two old ladies playing Scrabble. <laughs> and they're just the sweetest old ladies. And then you look down and they're, you know, they're spelling out naughty words. And the F word. And then yeah. F her. And then mother F her. And then she spells uh, it M U T H E R. And instead of being like, is that spelled wrong? It's like, I think that's hyphenated. Oh, okay. Well, we'll know what it So great. So great. And just such a throwaway little moment. Yeah. The, the whole chase scene at the end is brilliant. Oh, my you God. You know? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Far out. Oh, far out. Far out. Far out. Guy has one line, and he, you know, it's far like. Out. It's like yeah. every in- incarnation of that line. But, and then, you know, and then the hilarious Japanese couple at the end. Oh, my God. They're you so know, good. Bang, bang, Kojak. And just fun. And the fact that you know, even, like, you know, you got Billy Barty. She throws him out the window. And then it's this whole Looney Tune thing. He falls He's into rolling. He yeah. falls into a barrel. Like a drum. Yeah. yeah. And, and then a, the barrel rolls and down. And just rolls and rolls and rolls. Bounces, bounces, bounces. Then he hits a thing. He goes flying up and then into a manhole. An open manhole. Well, no, that's what he, <laughs> he hits a thing. And then a car hits the yes. barrel. And, the, and then he flies out because that's what happens. And you hear this. And he manages bleh. to go straight into. Uh, and he's such a great screamer. And, and, just, and I, I will I will always forever love this movie because of the scene after that. Because it could have ended. Yes. He could have if this was remade now, that second scene never would have been. No, the movie. because this in the second scene, 
just shows what a nice person she yeah. is. And what a yeah. nice person he is. And he t- a, a part that could have been a throwaway. Yes. He turns into something really substantial. Yes. And it's it, it, there's no reason for it to be in there. Especially no. the second part. There's no, no reason for it to be in there. No. And the fact that they kept it in, you're absolutely right. That's what makes this movie so charming and fun. There's no like throwaway stuff, mostly. You no. know, It just seems no. like everything pays off really well. And, you know, they do have these crazy... Looney Tunes moments, and there's that the one of the greatest fight scenes ever between Burgess Meredith and uh, Rachel Roberts. And Rachel Roberts, this karate fight that is, ch- and he's like <laughs> seventy. The, be- the best they go up, and he's like, he's like, well, we're gonna go do like Chevy Chase is like, we're gonna go do this thing now. You should stay here, old man. I'm and he's like, you. no. And then he tries to chop a block in half, <laughs> and it doesn't work. And then he does it. And then Chevy Chase is like, all right, come on, all right, all right. <laughs> it's not, it's not like, oh well, that's weird. Come with me. Yes, and it's just like Chevy Chase and Burgess Meredith solving <sighs> crimes. Come on. Oh my god, I want to see that. Yes, movie. yeah. And it's just and then the whole like she was one tough mama <laughs> he's got a pet kicking. that fight went on for so it long it went on forever and it was and, great and the poor Chevy Chase and Goldie Hawn are just tied up staring like well we're just gonna watch and their reactions are perfection it, so good it's just so fun it's just a fun movie it may start a little bit slow but it just ramps up and ramps up and ramps up and ramps up to yeah. an amazing climax yes and the funniest thing, and it's just gross, but you know, the two people get killed and they're and, and it's disturbing the way yeah. that they're caught well, up I in mean, the rigging of the, of of the sets. And like and then and then the Apparently the Pope really likes murder. So he starts clapping. <laughs> hey, this um, was great. And then, you know, then the curtain comes back up and they're making out and then they have to do the the bows. The bows. It's and then the credits is just basically a trailer of the movie. It just seems from the movie you just so watched. Weird. I thought it was going to be outtakes and it's yeah. not. It's <laughs> like, it's hey, remember that movie you just watched? Hey, here it is again. You remember this part? Remember yeah. this part was fun. This was a fun part. I, I really can see how this influenced like the Venture Brothers. Yes. Like I can totally see like Hank and Dean being Chevy Chase and Goldie Hawn as kind of the straight like normal people and then all the weirdos around them. Yeah. Like I can totally see. I mean it has to be um what's his name? Jackson Jackson Public. Jackson Public. Uh I get, he totally was influenced. Well, he's he a, he's a Gen Xer. Been. Those guys yeah. are Gen Xers. I mean they yeah. they probably love foul play as much. I mean yeah. because that character the 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 albino character on on Venture Brothers is basically looks it's, it's and is dressed. Whitey Jackson. Yeah. yeah. He's dre- just like him. But it's just, and Dudley Moore, you get the introduction of Dudley Moore. And you also have these great older actors like Mark Lawrence and Chuck McCann. Yeah. And, and it just comes together. It's a joyous movie. It is. It is a, one of those movies that I need to go back to. I, I, I've stayed away from this movie for so long. Yeah. I don't know why. You just. Yeah. I've been trying to like not watch a lot of stuff that I've watched and right. try to watch right. things that I haven't seen. Right. Because right. it's very easy to get caught back into your old oh, yeah. comfort food, oh, so yeah. to speak. But this movie is, I haven't laughed so hard to the point where I was crying in the longest time. And it's not necessarily this is the funniest, mo- funniest movie in the world, but it harkens back to something in me th- that created my lifelong obsession and love of comedy yeah and the yeah. stuff that you watch when you're six seven eight yeah years old there's always going to be just a place in your heart for oh these. yeah yeah and watching it again it holds up it is a oh, funny yeah. Yeah. funny it is movie. it does it really does it's and really if, great. if you haven't seen it or if you haven't seen it in a while and you're like eh, Chevy Chase Give it a uh, look. Give it a look. Man. It is available for free on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, you have to deal with commercials, but it's but it's worth it. Check Get a free it out. trial, so yeah. you don't have to yeah. watch the commercials. Yeah. But also pick it up for ten bucks. Yeah, you, you can know? definitely find it somewhere. Throw it for, in your collection. Cheap. Yeah, because it is a definite classic comedy. And Brian Dennehy. I mean, you have so Billy Barty. You have so many great aspects to this that just come together for just one of those magical. Films that just makes you feel good yeah. after watching it. We'll be back next week. We're going to continue our Hitchcockian comedy. Throw with, Mama uh, from the Train. Throw Mama from the Train. Aaron! Aaron! <laughs> I'm so excited to cover this movie. Aaron, you're your friend. Another very dark comedy. <laughs> you're your friend, Aaron. You're your Aaron. <laughs> That's my. Uh, that's my Billy Crystal impersonation. <laughs> nice. That's going to be a fun episode. <laughs> we'll see you next week.
They would be sued for damages if they implored. Oh, sorry, that's Farrah Fawcett. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Weird that she sounded like yeah, that. Yeah, she's a very, very deep voice. We now return you to your regularly scheduled programming, Matlock, already in progress. <laughs> 